Glory to Jesus Christ. Oops. So we're reading the Gospel of Mark. I'm using this translation, the second Catholic edition of the Revised Standard Version. Uh, and uh, this, I'm using the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible New Testament for the f using the footnotes also. And I'm using the commentary from the Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture, the Gospel of Mark by Dr. Mary Healy, and the Collegeville uh, New Testament Reading Guide, Liturgical Press from 1960, of uh, Gerard Sloyan. This, I think, was 2008, or 2008, uh, published by... Uh, Baker Academic, that's it. And also the Navarre Bible, the Navarre Bible, New Testament, their commentary. And that was published by Four Courts Press Dublin and Scepter Publishers New York, uh, published in 2008. So that's that. So let's get in, get in to the written word and read the, let's pray the prayer. Let's pray a prayer for, uh, for direction that we might read scripture in, uh, under the umbrella of prayer, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in apostolic tradition in, uh, out of which your interpretation will be wrong. Uh, and uh, as uh, interpreted by the, the authoritative church, the Catholic church. Yeah. So there, and actually some people say, oh, the Catholic church is so rigid in this interpretation, but it's not. Because we have what they call the senses for uh, just about any verse. There's the literal sense, which is not necessarily literalistic. And the uh, and that's the basis for the other interpretations. And the, the different senses, the spiritual senses, there's uh, the allegorical, uh, which is, and especially the typological, which you know, Christ fulfills this. This is that's the most common use of the Old Testament by the New Testament. Then there's the moral in which you interpret things in the light of the ethical teachings of Jesus, in the light of his revelation, uh, which might mean a, a passage will be completely different from its literalistic interpretation. Like, you know, go and kill all your uh, the people of the country you invade, or men, women, and children, stuff like that, uh, which is obviously totally contrary to Jesus' teachings, uh, when Jesus, who corrects, who is God, and kind of so he can correct the stuff that went before or was misdirected. Um, so it, it, so a, spirit, a moral meaning of that can be you're, you are not to tolerate even the smallest sins and stuff like that, but and not to... Uh, uh, get in a cozy agreement with your vices. So there can be that. Then there's the epigogical, which is about the end things, heaven, hell in particular. But, uh, and what is there another one? I think those are the, the three, the four. I think those are the four meads. So so we're on the Gospel of Mark. We're, we're reading the Gospel of Mark. And this is the sixth chapter and the feeding of the 5,000, and also of the apostles returning. Uh, so there's that, but let's pray first. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Holy God, holy, mighty one, holy, immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy, mighty one, holy, immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy, mighty one, holy, immortal one, have mercy on us. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O heavenly King, comfort a spirit of truth, who are everywhere present and filling all things. O treasury of blessings and giver of life, come dwell within us and cleanse our souls, O gracious Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Blessed Lord, who have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may wisely hear them, read them, mark them, learn and inwardly digest them, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. So, and if you're following along in the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, this is page 76 in the Revised Standard Catholic. Verse 30, chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a lonely place by themselves. Now they saw them going and knew them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. As they landed, he saw a great throng, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a lonely place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the country and villages round about and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down by companies upon the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves... And the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set them before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. And if we have time, we'll get into Jesus walking on the water. Let's put this on the bottom. This pile of books. There, and there. So we'll start off with the commentary on um, from uh, the uh, from uh, Gerard Sloy, Sloyan on page page what page fifty three page fifty three in the booklet which is from nineteen sixty and it's an original I got this I think I got it in nineteen sixty seven at Sheehan's bookstore in downtown Boston. So, so the apostles come together. This is before, I'm going to give my own thing first. And they reported to him all that they had done. And we should really do that every day. It's a good thing to review the day, have a review of life of the day and go over it. Often it's not good to do this just before you go to bed because that can really wake you up. But to do that, and some people do this, you know, different times of the day, maybe three, two, three times a day. And you know, go over the day before. Opportunities missed, um, uh, things to repent of, but uh, things that that went well, 
uh, all of this, and, and to do it always in a spirit of thanksgiving. When we, you know, that, you know, even say, well, what, you know, what if I messed up into this? Thank God that you can repent. Thank God that you can turn this over to God and God can use it. So, uh, so they reported what to him, all that they had done and taught. Because remember, uh, especially uh, as a priest or someone who's teaching the faith, we have to teach the faith, not just my opinion, especially if my opinion is contradiction in contradiction to the moral teachings of the Catholic faith, uh, Catholic Christian faith, or in contradiction to uh, the doctrines of the church, in contradiction to uh, scripture uh, read in uh, apostolic tradition, uh, in contradiction to natural law and the like. So uh, we, uh, those who are in teaching positions really need profound humility. That we're, you know, that my creativity is not the main thing or even sometimes a useful thing in, in teaching these things. <clears throat> but uh, my openness to the Holy Spirit is a, a crucial thing. So we need, we need that humility. So he says to them, doesn't say, okay, well, go off. You know, the, this, he, he, in another place he said, we're, we're it's such a, a need. Go out, uh, b barely packed with almost nothing. Run out. No, no uh, uh, walking staff or sandals in one version of it. No money. No whatever. Just go out because this is so urgent need. And go out to everyone. But here, he says, come away and rest. And we need that. We need uh, emotional rest. We need intellectual rest. We need physical rest. <clears throat> and the more active we are, the more we need it. <clears throat> the more pastoral uh, a clergyman or religious or, or, or um, pastoral associate or whatever, or, or, or part-time church worker, even let alone full-time work, person needs to come aside with Jesus and to be quiet with him. Now, I'm a squirmy type of person. I do most of my prayer and walking around, if I can. Of course, I'm trying to get my five miles a day walk in. Um, but I also need to just sit down, shut my eyes, and shut everything out. And just focus on God. And to try to listen to what he's going to tell me in some way. And sometimes when I do that, I don't get anything. Other times, I pop my eyes open. It seems so like something. Sometimes it's just Desi and I listening to the birds chirping or something like that. Uh, all that. Um, and I need to do more of that. But uh, in a prayer life, you really need a diverse diet. You know, things, uh, uh, reading prayers from prayer books, especially the liturgy, the liturgy of the hours, the mass, especially, which is the highest prayer, and uh, and the like, and and scripture reading, a, a, a meditative reading of scripture. And you usually take a small bit and repeat it over and over. It's often good to read different translations, and do that, and discuss it with God, and, and do that, and ponder it, and do that, and do that over and over. So, a, a small bit to do that. Uh, that's good. That's Lexio Divina, divine reading. Uh, but always, of course, in scripture, it should be prayerful. And uh, as I said, in communion with the, the whole body of Christ, especially the the uh, magisterium of the Catholic Church. Um, I'm doing that, uh, and then things like uh, uh, short prayers, like, Jesus, I love you. Lord, have mercy. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, sinner. And just the name of Jesus, you know, breathing in and out. Uh, I do it in, in Latin or Greek. Jesus. Jesus. And doing that, just sitting there, doing that, or walking, doing that. Or you're trying to get to sleep, try that. Counting sheep never worked for me. That sometimes has worked, but not always. Uh, you may need the sleep aid or whatever, but, um, and you need to prepare yourself for sleeping, uh, uh, you know, get, get ready for that, prepare your body and your mind for, for sleep. So, uh, we need 
we need a, a, a deep prayer life. And the busier we are, the more we need it. And, and of course, you don't have to make appointments with God. God's there all the time. Just talk to God in your head. With one. And, you know, if you're doing something and you don't need to focus your great intent uh, attention to it, uh, you know, sing hymns <coughs> or do these little things. <coughs> I find the rosary very useful. Uh, not that I can meditate and do them at the same time. Uh, I find that difficult. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, but the meditations on that, the, the mysteries to do that, the mysteries of the life of Christ, to think of that. And sometimes to just think of the words. Another time to just let the words wash over you. And that and just uh, bathe in, in, in the words. Um uh, various other things, chaplets, all sorts of things. So hymns, hymns are they were a big thing for me. Um, all sorts of things. And conversing with God, just converse about anything. Uh, just talk to God about everything, especially when you get distracted or in, in times of temptation to call on the Lord for all that, whatever the temptation is. But there's a, a diversity of prayer diet. So just as a diversity in physical diet, you know, you might say, well, I love ice cream, but, you know, if I just ate ice cream, that wouldn't be healthy. Or even if I said, oh, I just, I love uh, salads. If I only ate salads, I wouldn't be healthy either. So I need a, a healthy diet, I, which means a diversity. You know, have all the major food groups and all this stuff and make sure I get my protein, you know, get the good carbs, uh, good, good, the good fat, stuff like that. So we that's true in our prayer diet, too. We need that. So then he said, come apart into a deserted place and rest a while. So and just do that. And uh, uh, that's not always easy. You know, if you're really busy, let's say, you know, you have, you know, you have three, or you have a three year old and a, 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 a five year old. <coughs> And um, and your all the stuff is it was just hard to, do. but even pray with your children, pray with your, uh, teach them little ditties, little hymn ditties, things like that, uh, doing that pray with them and all that. And then you know, uh, there's one moment I just uh, when I go to the bathroom, that's really the only time I have alone, and so I pray pray in the bathroom. But um, the um, so they said, for they were many coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. I think this is the uh, confraternity version uh, of the Douai Rance or something. Uh, that uh, that uh, Gerard Sloyan is using in the 1960s. But they did have the, con the confraternity version already. And there were other translations that were out, newer Catholic translations that were out other than the Douai Rance, which was revised in the uh, 1700s by uh, Bishop Challoner. And they got into the boat, so they're doing this a lot, remember they're fishermen, and, and that's the easiest way to get around, around this uh, Lake Gennesaret, this thing is by boat. And they went off to a deserted place, apart from, not apart from themselves. Well, maybe they did, maybe they went off as individuals into places like that, to just be alone with God. And many, saw them leaving and recognized them. And from all the towns, they hurried on foot to the place and got there ahead of them. So, well, so much for uh, water transport being faster than running around. But so when he landed, Jesus saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them. He was moved with pity on them. And so Jesus has literal compassion, which means suffering with. He suffered with us. He went through the full human struggle in his mortal condition, when in his earthly ministry, you know, it, 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 his life of that. And of course, he wasn't born into luxury. He wasn't born into uh, conveniences. He had uh, uh, almost none of the conveniences we have, the, uh, the things that make uh, life easier, make work easier. Didn't have any of those. Uh, not many of them. The wheel, yeah. They had that. They had some, of course, people are always ingenious and in trying to find labor savings devices and like but that, that's how, and you know and at this point in his earth he had nowhere to lay his head even so um so he took all this on himself and then you know he died which is the culmination of this taking everything on himself uh 
and rose from the dead, and we too will be raised bodily. So, of course, now he's not in the mortal condition. Now he's not. Uh, no more tears for him. Uh, and that, and we're drawn on in hope because that's our destiny, if we accept it, if we persevere in grace in this life. So they were like sheep without a shepherd. If, a sh if sheep don't have a shepherd, they wander all wrong and they can easily become prey of wolves and things like that. So I think of that, you know, telling uh, Catholic people said, you have to be really informed about the Catholic faith because there's all this misinformation being put out by those who are hostile to this. Now, some of those, these people are sincere, others aren't. And a lot of them, uh, I question the sincerity if they refuse to find out what the Catholic Church actually teaches. You know, so they said, no, 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 no. I just say, okay, do you have the catechism? Do you go with that? No. Do you, uh, so, but you're, uh, you're pontificating about what, what the Catholic Church is and how uh, uh, we're so evil and stuff. But, but I assure you what you're saying is misrepresenting. I, you know, I have post-master's degree work in Catholic theology and uh, all that. And I've been reading all of this. I read the catechism every day and uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church and, uh, and all sorts of other things about that. And, you know, and I read primary sources, of, uh, not just the scriptures, but, you know, Fathers of the Church and, and uh, decrees of councils and stuff like that. So uh, let me assure you, you're way off, but often they do absolutely not accept it. Now, some, they're afraid, because if they look into this, then uh, you, you know, we, the Catholic Church has to be this this monster, or they have to uh, start reconsidering uh, their positions, and maybe sometimes their positions, sometimes they're they're ministers of a particular uh, religion or something like that. So that that's uh, something that. But uh, and people, you know, we don't like change. We it's just so, and and it's always fun to have. A, a, someone that you demonize, but it's not good. So uh, sadly, there is enough bad done and uh, uh, a, a lot of hypocrisy and uh, people exploiting the church. But uh, that doesn't make the church's teachings are false because people, even people in leadership who aren't living them, who are doing the opposite, uh, that doesn't invalidate the teaching. It might invalidate them, but it doesn't invalidate the teaching. <clears throat> so he had compassion on the crowd, and we are to do that too. We are to be people of compassion, Christian passion, and in his humanity, because he's literally compassionate in his humanity. And of course, as God, he has all mercy, he has all knowledge, uh, and all, uh, no, even though the Father and the Holy Spirit haven't had the human experience that Jesus had, that God the Word had in his hypostatic union being 100% God, 100% human, and uh, one person, but without uh, mixing the two natures, without diluting the two natures, but in the integrity of the two natures. Um, so anyway, they were like sheep without a shepherd. So, And then he began to teach them many things. And, and Jesus and, and John says at the end of his gospel that even if all of all the if we had all the books of the world, it wouldn't be enough to fill Jesus' teaching, which is the oral tradition that he has. So now, when the day was far spent, the disciples came and said, "Oh, this is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send them away." But they're far away from things, so that they may go to the hamlets and villages. Around. But if there's such a crowd, the five thousand, just just the adult males, 5,000, then uh, these little hamlets aren't going to have enough for these people. Uh, some people try to, uh, those who are uh, in the, uh, under the so-called enlightenment influence, that there are no miracles. So, of course, if there are no miracles, there's no Christianity. Because, you know, the virgin birth, the incarnation of God, the eternal word, the bodily resurrection, the real presence of the Eucharist, the, you name it. So many of these things are, even a divine intervention at all is miraculous. Even divine attention, in a sense, is, is supernatural. It's just not natural. But he, God works through the natural as well. 
So um, they uh, they do this this miracle. So he organizes them. Then he says, "You get them some food." He's saying that to us, Dov. So, you know, we, we, in our comparative wealth, when, when they look at the rest of the world, uh, the so-called third world, uh, often the southern hemisphere, places at uh, many places, we have that obligation to share what we have. Now, a share according to your means, share according to your opportunities, share according to your abilities, and share according to your duties. You know, if I have a duty to my family, I can't take all, all my money and just give it away uh, to uh, a worthy charity. I have to take care of my family. <coughs> well, that's an obligation. So, um, so anyway, so this is... Uh, he said, are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of of bread? So that's, a, a denarius would be a day's wage for a very skilled worker. And uh, give them some to it. So that's 200. So that's a, a, about a year's salary of, uh, of a, of a well-paid skilled worker. And give them some to eat. It just wouldn't be enough. So, of course... Um, Answering a question with a question is very Semitic. And he said to them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. And so they come out and they have five and two fish. So, and in now, where is this? Uh, it was right here. There it is on the bottom. Anything you look for is on the bottom. So this is the gospel parallels. And in the gospel parallels, this story is a popular story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see now, where was I? Oh, here, I had marked it, but the paper fell out. Wouldn't you know it? Here we go. The feeding of the 12 subs. So, so Mark is there, and, uh, and Matthew, when they have it, he just says, now when Jesus heard this, so it said he withdrew to a lonely place, uh, to a, a deserted place, but in, here in Mark, it says, the apostles returned to Jesus. They have them. And also in Luke, on their return, the apostles told them what they had done. But Mark's is longer. And he said, told them all that they had done and taught. You have that. So then he has this, this personal invitation in Mark that's not there in either Matthew or Luke. There, in Matthew, it's Matthew 14, 13 through 21. And Luke 9, 10 through 17. So this is a good book to have. It's uh, gospel parallels, and there are different different versions of it. But it takes the synoptic gospels and puts them uh, uh, side by side, where, where they repeat, or, or, or where they have similar things, and then it shows the differences that they have and stuff like that. So, so anyway, and then the Christ. So we and uh, Luke says they uh, they went to a part to a city called Bethsaida, where they use city. I think they even use polis in these things, but I have to look that up and see what the Greek word for it is. But um, around Bethsaida, but there, this this is a deserted place. This this is out in the in the campo, out in the country somewhere. It says, and they followed him. And but what does Jesus in Luke? What does Jesus do? He welcomes them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God, and. Uh, Matthew also has a part, he had compassion on them and healed the sick, it says. But uh, Mark is the one who said the sheep without a shepherd, which is interesting because usually uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke uh, build on the on the Matthew thing, on the, Luke, uh, blah, 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 on the Mark thing. But here, they're uh, 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 more skimpy than Mark's thing of that. So, uh, uh, relating of this. So, uh, and so he began to teach them many things. And he's still teaching us many things. And so, uh, and in, um, in, Math, in Mark, it grew late. But in Matthew, it was evening. So that's really late. And then, I, I, I like this translation in Luke. Now the day began to wear away. So, uh, let them go and get provisions, to lodge and get provisions in Luke. And uh, 
But in, in Matthew, Jesus says, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. But uh, Jesus said, which is sort of a shocker for the, the, the apostles, uh, you give them something to eat. But it's only in, in, in Mark that they have this whole thing of the 200 denarii and stuff there. So, but they ask, well, what do you have? He said, we have five, only five loaves here and two fish. And then in uh, Luke again, uh, no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless we are to go and buy food for all these people, which we don't have the money for. And then, and Luke says, uh, bring them here to me, the fish, which was uh, elsewhere at the feeding of the 4,000, is it the, the boy with the, the his lunch? There. So uh, bring them here to me. So they do that. And then he organizes them, which is a, a foreshadowing of, of the organization of the church in one sense. And groups by hundreds and by fifties, would be parishes, um, or, and, and groups within parishes by the fifties, uh, the, the prefiguration of that. So, and he takes the fish and they sit down on the grass. You know, they should look out for ticks. Uh, and come in, in Mark, it's been companies, sit down by companies in the green grass. And it's, it's uh, Mark that has them uh, organized in hundreds and fifties. But then Jesus takes the loaves, six to five loaves, and the two fish. And then in, 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 Luke, he looks up, he looks up in there to heaven. And then, so there were these, Don Gregory Dix's uh, uh, shape of the liturgy, sort of thing, the, the, the actions, the actions of that. So he takes, so as in the, 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 uh, the bread is brought up or whatever. And then uh, he takes the bread, the priest takes the bread, it's Jesus doing this. And he blesses, consecrates the, the barakah of the consecration. This is my body, this is my blood, and broke it. So there's always the fraxio panis, the uh, classis tuatu, which is one of the oldest names for the Eucharist, the breaking of the bread. And then, uh, so you have that. And then, um, and distributes communion. So we have that. And he gave the loaves to the disciples. And then the disciples give it to the people. So the, this thing of, uh, some see this uh, as, a, you know, as the uh, hierarchical receiving of communion. So the, this priests first, the bishops, priests, and the, then the deacons, and then the people. So would some try to say, oh, that's rude said, because they're the guests. Uh, we're not guests at this. We're the family at this. So, and they'd say, well, wouldn't the mother eat last? Well, I don't think that's actually a good, uh, a good thing, frankly. But um, uh, no, the, the uh, tradition is, you know, the, the clergy we see first, in particular, the, the, the celebrant, and the and the and then the presbyter is the priest, and of course this is a bishop there, even if he's not actually presiding. Although ironically they call it presiding, uh, he sits over on the side, and then he, uh, after the celebrant receives the host, and the celebrant goes over and, and give, give uh, gives the paten, uh, presents the paten to the the bishop, and the bishop takes takes his communion, and then the same with the chalice, the bishop goes first. Why is that? Because if a bishop can celebrates, he has to preside. Of course, if he's presiding with other bishops, that's a different story. But uh, uh, that's why. I so, because the, the the episcopacy, the bishop, is the fullness of the ordained priesthood, and the pope is in more a, a, a priest than a, any bishop. The lowliest, quote unquote, auxiliary bishop uh, is equal to the pope uh, sacramentally. So uh, in the sacrament of ordination and holy orders, which is plural, because there's the stages of it that are, or, uh, and, uh, uh, but the, you can have the calling to a particular stage of it, uh, to diaconate, to be a permanent deacon, 
or most who are ordained presbyters stay presbyters, they don't become bishops. And then the, the bishop there. So, and of course, the bishops and presbyters and deacons should be <clears throat> examined according to the pastoral epistles, what they say uh, are, are crucial qualities and behaviors of and virtues of deacons, presbyters, and bishops. Presbyter is uh, the long word, the uh, word priest is contracted from presbyter, and that's the second order of the ministerial priesthood. Most is baptismal priesthood, which is the foundational priesthood that we all have in baptism, uh, but it cannot replace the ministerial priesthood <clears throat> and vice versa. So anyway, they all ate and were satisfied. So that's the, that, uh, the satisfaction of receiving Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. But also there's the paradox that we hunger for more. We ha hunger not just to receive Jesus again in the blessed sacrament, but hunger to become in, in total unobstructed union with God the Trinity. Uh, to go into that. So, and then they got up, they said, took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So that's uh, the plural of an, uh, of an heir, or an heir andros, uh, which is an adult male. And then, but, uh, and it's Matthew who says, there were 5,000 men besides women and children. And, uh, Luke doesn't mention the numbers in that. Then, okay, so we've looked at the gospel parallels. We'll put you down here. Well, now to Sloyan. Page, page what? 53, okay. This transitional verse, that's verse 30, reports the follow-up on the mission of the Twelve, calling the apostles here, called the apostles, ho, ho, uh, uh, not hoi the Twelve, but apostles, uh, apostolos, apostoloi here, hoi apostoloi, here for the only time in Mark that they're called the apostles rather than the Twelve. He usually calls them the Twelve or the disciples. But he has just used the latter term, the uh, disciples, hoi mathete, some think Matthew comes from that, but actually Matthew comes from Aramaic, but uh, nonetheless. Um, in verse 29 of John's followers, so followers, disciples. In Matthew 10, too, they are the 12 apostles. Mark to report on their activities is no more specific than that on the instructions of Jesus as to the count of their preaching. This use of taught, didaskein, to teach, uh, uh, didaskalos is teacher, or didaskalos, uh, didache teaching, hey didache teaching, to describe the activity of anyone but Jesus is unique in the gospels. The disciples usually preach, the proclaim, uh, give the charisma, the uh, the uh, profound, the saving message. Kerug um, uh, saying, "Ooh, there's a fruit fly that came out of nowhere." Got it. Kerug um, saying or kerig saying. Kerigsayin, sometimes you hear it, stuff, stuff like that. Uh, oh, Keri saying, no, there's no G, there's no gamma in that. Um, if on this occasion they attempt to expose his doctrine, it is not likely that they had much success in it. For the unbroken testimony of our evangelists is that they did not understand it. The apostles didn't understand it, let alone the people. So Jesus summons of them to a place, Jesus summons them to a place away from the crowds and is described by Matthew as a result of his learning of the Baptist's death. So maybe they went and said, well, let's get away because we may well be next on the list of Herod's uh, head chopping. 
but not by Mark. Here it is only a means to obtain some nourishment and rest. Because it said they didn't even have time to eat. So there's a problem then. If you don't have the quote unquote leisure to eat, there's something wrong. You have to, you have to get that in. Even if it's, you know, pumping thing here. I remember often my mother, that's what she would be doing, but she would cook. She would sample everything so that she ended up having her meal before we did. Um, so, and then we'd set it out. Although uh, when my mother went to work, then uh, we had to share the responsibilities. I remember uh, when I was 12, my mother commissioned me to turn on the stew at a particular time and watch it or the uh, boiled dinner or whatever we were having then, you know, which was usually that. And she had it all ready and all I had to do was uh, take it out of the fridge and put it on the, on the, or even sometimes it was already on the, on the stove there, ready to turn it on. So um, uh, instructing children in chores, I think is a really crucial thing uh, that boys and girls, and uh, and get the girls out to shovel as well as the boys. Get the boys in to do the dishes and housework as well as the girls. Um, uh, where was I? Uh, Jesus summons them to a place away from the crowds. It's described by Matthew as a result of his learning of the Baptist's death, but not by Mark. Here it is only a means to obtain some nourishment and rest. Any wild portion of the lakeshore will do, though the secluded northeast corner is favored. It would be possible, though inconvenient, for the crowds to cross the bars of silts near the Jordan mouth on foot at certain seasons of the year. The escape of the company is observed by the eager crowd who hurry over land and cut themselves off to destroy the dream of seclusion. Elvis has left the building. The feeding of the 5,000, verse 34, starting with verse 34, going to 44. Again, for, verse 34 is transitional. It can look backwards to the zealous pursuit of Jesus or forward to the miraculous deed which will conclude his compassionate day of teaching. Because teaching is an act, should be an act of compassion also. It should be uh, also an act of humility. Uh, he feeds his flock with his word, as Moses proposed Joshua should do. <coughs> Many things is probably adverbial at length. So some people try to say, oh, oh John 6, it, he's feeding them with his word. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus said, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. And he says, my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. And it's in John six sixty six that they reject that, the people hearing that. Reject. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, uh, this is a metaphor, can't you take poetry? He doesn't say, that. lets them go. In fact, he turns <coughs> to the apostles and said, will you too also go? So it's obvious this is what he's teaching. He's teaching the real presence. And of course, it's he's God incarnate. That's not an issue. Some would say, oh, well, it, it, it's it's, it's cannibalism. But I was talking to a rabbi one time and they said, well, even if it was symbolic, it would be unkosher, haram. It would be uh, that, because we weren't supposed to take blood. We weren't supposed to uh, consume blood, uh, which is why the Jehovah's Witnesses have the thing about transfusions, which I always thought a little bizarre. But anyway, um, <clears throat> that was, you know, part of the thing. And even in Acts, you know, you're advised, you're not commanded. If you're a Gentile living among Jews, not to consume blood uh, in that. So, so they say, oh, well, that you couldn't be. But remember, it's an unbloody manner that you receive. You, you, you don't chew the flesh of Christ, even though that was often you to, to uh, bite with the teeth or chew with the teeth was often uh, something that was supposed to indicate that you had an orthodox belief in the real presence. But you don't do that. In transubstantiation, you chew the species or chemistry of the bread, not the body of Jesus. Uh, but you eat the body of Jesus, you receive the body of Jesus, but you don't digest the body of Jesus in a sense. 
uh, only symbolically in that, but you actually eat Jesus, um, but uh, not uh, the uh, the chemistry doesn't change. The essence changes. The substance changes into Jesus Christ truly present. So that's it. That's the Catholic and Orthodox teaching. Orthodox was capital O. Uh, that that's that. It's it, it, the fancy Aristotelian term for that is transubstantiation. That substance is changed from that. Uh, and and some say that that's uh, in the Our Father. I think it's Luke's Our Father. The uh, uh, super substantial bread. Uh, the, give us a give us. The super substantial bread, and then because I think the math is going to give us for the day, the daily bread. But anyway, back to this. Many things is probably adverbial at length and fits in perfectly with his tender concern in the advancement of the day. His followers point out the obvious to him and propose an equally obvious solution. The hamlets and villages are no help in identifying the area, and chances are they wouldn't have been much help in feeding 5,000 people. A crowd that could come on foot from its homes was also able to set about the lakeshore in the same way, not, however, without grave inconvenience, because now it's evening, according to Ma the Matthew, and all this other stuff. So the, ma the master, Jesus, suggests to those close to him that they do the impossible. He's calling for miracle. They demur forcefully. What? If we had, you know, 200 days wages, we could not feed all these people. A, a year's salary, uh, we couldn't feed that. This bold give and take provides much of the charm of Mark's narrative. The denarius was a laborer's daily wage. And when I say the skilled laborer, uh, a daily wage, a, a, a good pay for a, a, a laborer. From the tone of their question, 200 sounds like a minimum figure, which they do not have in any case. When barely able to meet the situation, because remember they've given up all for Jesus anyway. Jesus is pre, and they have, uh, there's a miracle, you know, uh, not a miraculous draught of fish in this situation, but a uh, a miraculous multiplication of fish. So, dried fish probably. And I hope the bread was nice and fresh. Fresh pita bread, that's what I think of. Uh, anyway, but um, I'm going to yawn. Um, Jesus is preemptory in taking them, asking them to take stock of their joint resources, which, isn't, which aren't even theirs. It's somebody else's lunch or supper. This next, his next command tests his disciples' fidelity in that they cannot carry it out without engendering widespread expectation of something to follow immediately. So, you know, when they tell people to sit down and that, you know, the, 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 the bread and the fish are taken, uh, reclining is a posture of eating. Um, I prefer sitting up in a chair myself, by the way, with a table or at least a tray. <clears throat> the distinctive, the distributive phrase in groups, symposia, so a symposium was a group, a symposium, with a, in particular, a uh, uh, coming together for, to eat and talk and, uh, and the like. Uh, that it, we see this in, uh, uh, among Greek philosophers and uh, the, uh, the use of the word symposion. It's symposion, I think it is. Um, symposion. Uh, but here it's groups, groups in plural. Uh, we cannot be sure how much the detail of green grass tells us of the season. <clears throat> a meadow is not required. Tufts of sedge grass 
could easily satisfy the celebrated phrase describing groups of hundreds and fifty means literally garden plots, garden plots. It, in, in fact, symposia is repeated. Symposia, 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 symposia. Garden plots, garden plots. <coughs> uh, groups, groups. <coughs> groups of hundreds and fifties. The reference is to orderliness chiefly. One must admire, so uh, worship is to be orderly. Uh, the church is to be orderly. Uh, the phrasing of this account and that of the chap of chapter eight is patterned on stylized Eucharistic usage that I just talked about with Dom Gregory Dix. Both accounts and that of the Last Supper probably have a common origin in the primitive liturgy. Our Lord's uh, and liturgy would be the breaking of the bread, the Eucharist, because uh, liturgy also means it means public worship. So. You know, when you get to Liturgy of the Hours, the official worship of the church is liturgy, whatever it is. The sacraments, the uh, uh, Liturgy of the Hours, the uh, divine office of any rite. So, because uh, the different rites have different ways of doing it. My favorite is the ordinariate uh, morning and evening prayer thing. I, that's my favorite. But anyway, you get a, a good chunk of scripture, Psalms. Prayers, canticles, yes, nice. and then they're in two, two things. So anyway, uh, wait, wait. So our Lord, looking up to heaven, is always prayerful. Looking up to heaven is a prayer. So sometimes that's all you can do. Just look, glance upwards, because uh, your mind is exhausted, your body's exhausted, everything, everything is spinning around in, in life. His blessing of the loaves, the barakah, is a prayer of thanksgiving at the least, but more of praise of the Father, the uh, barakah in Hebrew there. But uh, so saying a blessing is uh, eulogion or eulogia. Um, our word eulogy comes from that. Um, it's a good words. Uh, logi, uh, log, logos, good word, logos, and with the uh, the prep, uh, the the word for good stuck on it. All right. Um, the loaves are hard, dis, uh, disc-like bread. You know, uh, could be hard. You know, it depends on when they were made. Um, when they were baked. Uh, and often that would be, you'd want some of these hard things to, hard tack sort of stuff to last. To say if you were going on a, uh, a way. Um, their breaking is a constant use of this event by Jesus and Mark to typica, typify the forthcoming Eucharist, which will at first be known as the breaking of the bread. A classis to our tool that I talked about. Not to be confused with autoclasia in the Byzantine liturgy, which is not, the bread isn't consecrated. It's not, it's, it's a liturgical use of, of bread, wine, oil stuff, but it's not the Eucharist. The breaking of the bread is the Eucharist. So, uh, as in Moses' time, when bread came from heaven, the manna, each man now has his fill. The ubiquitous Jewish wicker baskets are put to use to collect the leftovers. The detailed enumeration of the remaining fragments and the persons in the crowd, 12, 12 baskets full, underlines the miraculous aspect. And there have been other miracles of multiplication of the loaves. Say, uh, my uncle knew someone who was at a multiplication of the loaves uh, that the Lord did through St. John Bosco for uh, his uh, hungry orphan or, and, or street boys. And, that. and this kid was... Uh, uh, five or six at the time, and uh, he, you know, he was his parents died or something. He he doesn't even know how he ended up on the streets of Turin, but he was there and he got his roll and he's eating it. And uh, John Bosco said, "We're going to run out. I have to go and beg some more at the bakers, you know, for their day old bread or whatever or stuff that." They can't sell yet because people wanted really fresh, you know, they were Italian, of course. And uh, the uh, so he went off and he left 
a helper to distribute the, the well the helper and this little kid was standing over the basket and every time he lifted up a roll there was a roll underneath so he never got to the bottom uh, and, and so every kid got a roll and there was still stuff left and this kid was watching but the kids he's, he's he, this guy became a solution brother and was sent to uh, Argentina and had lived in, I think, Barra del Plata, where my uncle was at the time. He was also a solution. It, my uncle was young at the time it would, when he talked to this, and this guy was really old because that's happened to the 19th century somewhere. This would have been around around 1940 or something, so he would have been really old. But my uncle used to say about him, too, he used to say, two fingers of wine isn't this, two fingers of wine is that. So... <laughs> um, and so, and, but he, he said, well, uh, 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 God honors the prayers of Don Bosco. So he wasn't, he wasn't surprised. It was like Father McNutt one time when he was in India uh, for a healing service. And uh, no one even said they, no one was jumping up and down when they were healed. They just said, oh, thank you. And they asked, I said, well, we usually get a reaction. Is this Indian culture? He said, oh, no, they believed when you said that there were going to be healings, that there were going to be healings. And they just trusted God in that. So <clears throat> he went on. So uh, the detailed enumerator, so the number 12 is very probably a fulfillment figure. You know, the 12 tribes and all that, the 12 apostles. The new Israel in its entirety had been satisfied and fullness remains. So that's. Gerard Sloy. And, and let's look at the Catholic commentary on sacred scripture, the Gospel of Mark by Mary Healy, page 121, chapter 6, verses 30 and following. After the interlude on the death of John the Baptist, Mark picks up where he left off at the mission of the apostles. <coughs> who now return to Jesus and report to him all that they had done and taught. <clears throat> Although Jesus' recent instructions did not mention teaching, it was part of the ministry for which the, he had appointed them. This brief passage, you know, 3032, serves as a hinge, concluding the mission of the Twelve and preparing for the theme of nourishment and bread, on which the next major section will focus. Jesus recognizes that after their period of intense apostolic labors, the twelve need to be refreshed once again in his presence and in their fellowship with one another. To be with him remains a frequent requirement of fruitful apostleship that must be constantly renewed. See John 15, 4. The deserted place recalls the desert of uh, John the Baptist at the beginning thing there, a place of testing and also of, of no, Jesus' um, temptation of the desert. And then, of course, the the desert of the, the place of testing of the uh, Israelites, the Sinai desert that they went through there. Um, where was I? Oh, yes. A place of solitude. Again, it's the honeymoon aspect of that in Hosea and in the book of Revelation where uh, the woman, Mary, is uh, taken to a place prepared, which I always saw as a uh, an allegory of the assumption, but, um, but uh, not everyone has seen it that way. Uh, where was I? Deserted place. A place of solitude and retreat where God's people withdraw from the world for special intimacy with him. Jesus' desire to give them rest evokes the rest that God pledges to give his people in the promised land. See Exodus 34, 33, 14, Deuteronomy 12, 10. See also Hebrews 4, 9 to 11. It also shows his concern for the practical physical needs of those who spend themselves in his service. For the fact that people were coming and going in great numbers, it may be inferred that the apostles' preaching of repentance had hit the mark. That was earlier in chapter 6, uh, verse 12. Uh, yeah, ish. 
More people than ever were being drawn to Jesus and prepared to receive his teaching and his healing power. Once again, Mark notes that the apostles' ministry was so demanding that they had no opportunity even to eat. They are taking on the character of Jesus, who subordinates his personal needs to his ministry to his people. And that's true of all those who were ordained. But of course, I'm not Jesus. You know, I can't go 40 days without eating. Sorry. Uh, I can't go eight hours without eating, except for sleeping. Uh, but, um, no, we, those who are ministering have to attend to their personal needs as well, because they're not going to get on. Again, a, a, a story about St. John Bosco. So he, they were, oh, these kids were desperate that he was trying to help. And he was in this loft or something like that. So he was, not eating properly, not eating at all. So, so someone came into him and he had completely passed out. He had been, you know, not sleeping, not eating, all this stuff. So I think it was uh, St. Joseph Cafasto said, wait a minute, you're not God. And you're in a mortal body. You have to take care of that. You have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of your, your whole person, even emotionally, you know, to uh, you know, be nourished emotionally even. Uh, so he learned from that. He was young at the time. So, and uh, But uh, no a clergyman should have a messiah complex. I'm not, you know, mighty mouse. Here, here I come to save the day, uh, let alone Superman. I have to be a channel of Jesus and I have to pace myself in these things, especially as I'm now a geezer. But um, anyway, the place turns out not to be so deserted after all. This brief passage illustrates the rhythm of Christian apostolic activity, which ought to alternate between periods of intense labor and periods of simply being with Jesus. Here we can imagine him taking time with each disciple to listen to the reports of their successes and failures, to encourage, counsel, and redirect them where necessary. What spiritual refreshment they must have found in this debriefing conversation. It is true that the demands of apostolic activity, both then and now, will occasionally preempt the need for physical and mental rest. But the temptation for those of us who work in Christ's vineyard is to get caught up in the busyness of ministry, that we repeatedly ignore the need for prayer, rest, and stillness in God's presence. When that happens, it is all too easy to begin imperceptibly substituting our own agenda for the Lord's. Authentic Christian ministry is rooted in prayer, and since apart from him we can do nothing, John 15, 1-8, nothing. Apart from grace, nothing. Apart from Christ, nothing. Uh, we do not pull ourselves by our bootstraps. We are not Pelagians. How can we carry out the Lord's work except in the strength of the Lord? See First Peter 4.11. And how can we be renewed in that strength except by waiting in his presence? Just being there with the Lord. Uh, there, St. Jean Vianney one time went into the church and there was a man there who used to just come in and sit in the back of the church. I don't know if they had pews or not, but often they'd have things around the walls, chairs for us older folk. And uh, he was smoking a pipe, actually, in church, his own incense, I suppose. Uh, and uh, he said, well, what, what do you do here? And he said, I look at him at the tabernacle I look at him, he looks at me. So that's that. Uh, often we think, you know, I should really accomplish a great deal in the prayer and stuff like that. And if I don't have, you know, these marvelous, you know, uh, prayer experiences, mystical experiences, uh, revelations, uh, uh, satisfactions, spiritual comforts with consolations that St. Teresa of Avila called, then it was a failure. No. In fact, that could be even better that uh, because there's the greater sacrifice involved in it. Well, understanding the bread. 
The bread serves as a key word for an understanding of Jesus and his mission, which his disciples often lack. The Mark here prepares the reader to grasp the significance of the ultimate climactic bread event in the gospel, the Eucharistic banquet. Ultimately, the bread signifies the passion and glory of the Son of Man, and not just signifies in a, an abstract way, but uh, makes present what it stands for, that the, 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 the sign contains the reality. Who will give his life for us is spiritual food. The compassion of Jesus. The previous scene ended with Jesus and his disciples going off to a deserted place for some much needed, needed rest. But now these people go before him, they run on foot, they arrive before him, this vast crowd. So his hope for retreat is sabotaged, as we say. But he's moved with pity at the sight of the needy crowds. This is one of the few occasions where Mark gives us a glimpse into the emotions of Jesus. What's that? Um, where was I? Oh, yes. Uh, his emotions. It shows the glimpse into the emotion. Here using a verb that connotates a deeply felt gut reaction. You know, his, his, his innards were churned up. Uh, uh, see also 141 and 82. Pity or compassion. This pity can sometimes be almost a disdainful sort of thing. Uh, but compassion isn't. Uh, is one of the most distinctive attributes of God, mercy. See Psalm 86, 15, and Isaiah 54, 7 to 8, and Hosea 1, 8. Of course, literally, it's only true in Jesus because it's suffering with. Literal compassion, uh, you have to have, have a human consciousness, a human nature, a, a human body to do that. Uh, but of course, again, it's an analogy to God uh, for that. But uh, it, as I say, it's literally true in Jesus and his human nature, uh, which, of course, is hypostatic united with his divine nature. So, like sheep without a shepherd. So shepherdless sheep scatter, vulnerable to predatory beasts. And when leadership fails, God's people are likely to stray away from fidelity to him and become prey to their enemies. So it's important to be uh, much more than a vague Catholic. This, uh, if we're going to survive as Catholics or Christians, we have to be heroic. No, it's, it's, uh, well, it's not quite like, you know, living under communism or Nazism, but, um, we get scorn, we get all this stuff, we get no help. So uh, we have to uh, get ready for this. So I remember in my confirmation, the bishop would uh, tap you, slap you. And that was, we were told, they said, that's to remind you that uh, you're to stand up for the faith. And in doing that, you're going to experience opposition. And living out this faith, there's going to be suffering. And sadly, for millions of Christians in the world now, there is actual persecution, even uh, to death in many places like uh, Nigeria uh, and, and, uh, some, and, and other places. Uh, Christianity is the most persecuted religion, indeed the most persecuted ideology, quote unquote, in the world at this time, with Catholicism uh, at the height of that in many places. So expect scorn. Uh, but as Jeremiah was told, set your face like flint to get this. But uh, make sure, but don't return the scorn. Uh, uh, be sarcastic at times, yes, that's useful. But uh, at times. But uh, persevere in patience and in charity, which is going to be hard in that because you just want to sock somebody sometimes. But uh, no, 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 no. Um, wait, wait. So, anyway, so the feeding, this is page 126 in, in um, uh, Healy. 
The feeding of the 5,000 is one of the most memorable events in Jesus' public ministry. In fact, the only miracle attested in all four Gospels. So we looked at the synoptics, but it's also in John, John 6, 5 through 13. Mark recounts this dramatic event, like the earliest supper with sinners, in chapter 2, <coughs> 15 through 17, as not only a meal, but also a revelation of Jesus' identity and messianic mission. Almost every line echoes the Old Testament, providing clues to the meaning of Jesus' action, in contrast to the opulent Herodian banquet that had been accounted with, resulted in John the Baptist's uh, death. Here, Jesus feeds ordinary people with very simple fare, leading to life. Verses 5 through 39 contain the most extended conversation in Mark, which begins with the disciples' commentary recommending that Jesus dismiss the people for supper. This seems like a reasonable suggestion, but in reality it shows that they fail to perceive the significance of what is happening, a fail that will recur several times in the bread section, any bread section. Uh, John 6, oh, oh, that, see, see uh, chapter 6, 52 here in, John, in, in Mark, 7, 18, 8, 8, 17, and 8, 21. What they have missed, they are reminded that they are in a deserted place. Eremos topos. Uh, the word topography comes from the Latin, Greek word for place. And eremitical comes from the, the Greek word for uh, heremos, uh, for, which is feminine, even though it has a masculine ending, uh, for desert. A deserted place. It also means... Uh, Desert, not just some uh, ultra-dry, sandy, rocky place, but it means a deserted place, uh, sparsely inhabited. But in the Old Testament, the desert or wilderness, again, every most can be wilderness, is the very place where God himself provides superabundantly for his people. In the desert, God had shown his goodness by feeding the people with manna. What is it? Exodus 16, the bread from heaven. So, of course, as a result of this, in John, the people say, well, that's good, but we, if, if you're the new Moses, we want, uh, if you're the Messiah, we want evidence to do the miracles of Moses. We want bread from heaven. They wanted manna. But Jesus says, I'm the bread of heaven. And then he gives the bread of life discourse. See Psalm 78, 24, 25. And the food of angels, which is often brought up in uh, uh, Eucharistic hymns. The food of angels from wisdom 16, 20 to 21. Of course, angels don't need physical food. In fact, they can't have physical food. They can, it can look like it, but they can't have it. Um, because they are not bodies. Uh, by letting the Israelites experience hunger and then providing for their physical needs, God has taught them that he would satisfy their spiritual hunger as well. Not by bread alone does man live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of the Lord, Deuteronomy 8.3, which is what Jesus uses in his uh, Bible verse, parrying with uh, the devil. The, uh, the disciples have overlooked the significance of these biblical events for their present situation. By asking Jesus to send the people away, they are suggesting that he let the sheep fend for themselves, as if by leaving Jesus, the people will get something they cannot get from him. Ironically, the disciples advise that the people buy themselves something to eat, unaware that Jesus is already fulfilling God's promise to provide a food that no money can buy. You who have money, no money, come, receive grain and eat, come without paying, without cost, drink wine and milk, hopefully not mixed together. Uh, why spend your money for what is not bread, your wages for what fails to satisfy? And often don't we do that? We, have people, we want amusements, we want this, that doesn't satisfy us. Heed me and you shall eat well, you shall delight in rich fare. So most, most of the people were sort of on the border of... Uh, starvation, but malnourishment is uh, often they, they couldn't get that. But, um, well, many people anyway. So uh, this imagery was very appealing to them. That's from Isaiah 55, 1 through 2, right after the, uh, the servant songs there, the song of the suffering servant. Jesus' reply is startling. Give them food yourselves. 
and so, you know, this is, so the disciples' response would be astonishing, and maybe sarcasm. Where can I get meat to give all these people? Can enough sheep and cattle be shadowed for them? If all the fish of the sea were caught for them, would they have had enough? Numbers 11, 13, and 22, that, uh, in the desert, that's the side I does it there. See Psalm 78, 19. Jesus does not answer directly, but instructs them to do what he tells them with what little they have, which turns out to be five loaves and two fish. Jesus does not create bread out of stones, which was the, the satanic temptation, which as a child, I said, oh, I wish he, I wish he did that. I wish he just, you know, that you could, you know, everything would be food out everywhere and uh, no one would go hungry or all this stuff, physically hungry. But uh, he calls us to come to that. See Matthew 4, 3 and Luke 4, 3. Oh, he doesn't do it out of the thin air, which would have been cool. But, uh, but to take and miraculously multiply what his disciples are able to give. And he does that with us. When we bring ourselves and our weakness and our brokenness, and he multiplies by the power of his grace in this action. A principle that will bear in all their future apostolic labor. So, in preparation for the miracle, Jesus instructs the people to sit down in groups. For Word for groups, we saw this earlier. Symposia, symposia. Suggests the image of guests reclining at a dinner party. Jesus is hosting a banquet in the desert. In the Messianic banquet foretold by Isaiah, Isaiah 25, 6, says that uh, on this mountain, God will provide rich fare, all that. And, and it's also where he says, I'll wipe away all the tears. I'll do that, which is uh, quoted in the book of Revelation. But the book of Revelation, is a, uh, much of it is quotes from the Old Testament, in particular apocalyptic literature, <coughs> or taking images or whatever like that from that and stringing them together. The green grass is not an accidental detail, but an allusion to the green pastures in which the Lord, the good shepherd, gives his people repose and sets a table before them. In the well-known Psalm, it also evokes the prophetic promise that God would transform the desert into a place of refreshment and life. Isaiah 35, 1 and Ezekiel 34, 25 to 31. The people's orderly seating in rows of hundreds and fifties recalls the arrangement of the tribes of Israel as they were camped in the desert. Exodus eighteen twenty one through 25. Once again, as in 1, 2 through 8, Mark hints that what is occurring is a new exodus. Exodus means coming out, uh, out of the way, the way out. Uh, ek. And hechodos again, a feminine word with a masculine ending. Uh, isn't grammar complicated? Um, wait, wait, wait. Oh yes. Once again, Mark hints that there what is occurring is a new Exodus in which God is feeding His people with new bread from heaven, His very self. See Exodus sixteen four. So He does this this foreshadowing of the Last Supper which is chapter 14 in Mark. There it's a bit. Uh, he took, blessed, and broke, and gave, distributed. You know, the four, <coughs> the fourfold uh, action of the Eucharist. He gave the loaves to his disciples to distribute to the people along with the fish. Fish, uh, ichthus, the early Christians used that as a, an anagram of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Yeah. Jesus Christos, what is it? Jesus Christ, Son of God. We also theo soter. That's yeah. Um, so that's that. Uh, oh, okay. Looking up to heaven, the traditional gesture of prayer, and one Jesus does a lot, I guess. It expresses the or it says she says expresses the orientation of his whole being to the Father. In the Holy Spirit, uh, which is what it was, to, uh, to, uh, to direct our whole being to the fa- we are direct our whole being to the Father through and in and with and because of Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Always Trinitarian, uh, 
thing. Our prayer life should be Trinitarian. Uh, everything should be Trinitarian in our relationship with God. And remember, the persons of the Trinity don't act separately. There's nothing separate about the Trinity. <clears throat> so anyway, the blessing, probably the customary Jewish thanksgiving for a meal. Baruch, Atoh Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech HaChalom, that. Hamotzi lechem in that would be that. Uh, Blessed are you, O Lord God, King of the Universe, who bring forth bread from the earth. Unlike the other verbs, gave is in a form that signifies a continuing action. So, uh, Jesus kept giving his disciples the bread to distribute to the people. The way for them to participate in his miraculous provision for the people is continually to receive from him. So we are, it's not as if Jesus gives something and said, okay, go take off. Uh, I'm going to take off. It, it's <clears throat> Creation isn't the uh, wound up watch, the wound up clock of, of the deists. But God is here with us. He hasn't gone off to Acapulco to uh, drink uh, margaritas or something. I don't know. No, he's here. He is here with us always in everything. To set before is a verb often used to express hospitality at table. Genesis 18, 8, 1 Samuel 28, 2, 22, and Luke 11, 6. And, you know, when, uh, the, the, uh, the heavenly messages at Mamre, uh, of the, the, uh, I think the, the Samuel 1, what is that? Is that, uh, is that Giddy? No, that's not Giddy. That was Judges. Uh, no, anyway, I can't think of what it is. Anyway. Um, oh, oh, the first Samuel one. That's uh, a Saul with the uh, Witch of Endor. That's what that is, I think. Um, Je accent Jesus' welcome of the people in contrast to the disciples' request to send them away. So often, you know, as, as ministers, you often have that sometimes you just... Oh, Oh, it's another person, especially if it's some of these repeaters, you know, uh, all the, but, um, but Jesus is there. Jesus is there. So we're called to respond according to that. And, and I always ask Jesus to say, every time I see anybody today, may I see you. Uh, give me the patience. Give me the thoughtfulness. Give me all that needed to, to be you to this person. Reminds me of a story Father Dorgan said about this woman who had gone to confession, and she had done all sorts of things. She had, she had uh, sexual promiscuity, all sorts of stuff. So the priest sort of lambasted her, and she said, "Yes, I'm Mary Magdalene on this side of the screen, but I was expecting Jesus on the other." So, and no, well, there are times we have to be blunt and direct. But uh, many times, but uh, it should always be done in in the compassion, in the stuff like that. But remember, we clergy are human beings. We get worn out all the stuff to remember that. But it's Jesus who does the absolving. And it's Jesus who changes the bread into the wine, uh, bread and wine into the, his body. But it's Jesus who uh, gives regeneration and baptism through the ministry of the church. They all ate and were satisfied. And so that's what Jesus said. The Lord will give you the bread you need and the water for which you thirst. No longer will your teacher hide himself, but with your own eyes you shall see your father. Isaiah 50, 30, 50. You open wide your hands and satisfy the desire of every living thing. So it's like, uh, spreading it out. That's Psalm 145, 16. And they... Uh, they fill these 12 wicker baskets. We talked about the 12 symbolism. Jesus' miracle overwhelmingly surpasses that of the prophet Elisha, who fed a hundred men with 20 barley loaves. Two kings, 42, 44. I don't know if I've ever had barley bread. But anyway, the enormous crowd includes 5,000 men who would amount to some 20,000 people with the exclusion of men and women. Remember when we did the Gospel Parallels, Matthew Matthew 14, there are 21 uh, mentions, uh, not counting men and women. 
I mean, not counting women and children. The disciples carefully gathered them up, letting nothing go to waste. The number 12 corresponding to 12 tribes is an oblique reminder that Jesus is gathering around himself a new Israel. Not only Jesus' teaching, but even his actions are parables, signs that point beyond themselves. This is page 129. For a deeper mystery, the early church recognized in the miracle of the loaves a symbolic anticipation of the Eucharist, when Jesus would share both word and food with his people. In fact, the structure of the Eucharist, the Eucharistic liturgy, follows the same pattern seen in the miracle. First, in the liturgy of the word, Jesus nourishes us with his teaching through scripture reading and the homily that breaks open their meaning, that it should be, uh, the homilies should do that. Although I'm now more into, uh, we have to preach, you know, uh, uh, t we have to teach in the preaching, we have to, uh, we have to get stuff across because people are just aren't getting the moral teaching, they're not getting the, uh, the doc doctrinal teaching and the defense of this, because often they're just sitting ducks like sheep without a shepherd to be plucked off by uh, aggressive uh, fundamentalists, Protestants of fundamentalist Muslims, uh, 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 secularists, radical secularists, simply. you name it, everything. You know, everybody see Catholics as easy pickings because often they're ignorant of their faith. <clears throat> then the liturgy, the, uh, the liturgy of the Eucharist. He nourishes us with the bread of life, his own body and blood given for us. Vatican Council II teaches the church, especially in the sacred liturgy, unceasingly receives and offers to the faithful the bread of life from both the table of God's word and of Christ's body. Dei Verbum 21. So there we go. Yet we offer him the few loaves and fishes we have, whether in leading a Bible study, volunteering in an outreach to the poor, or even making a, con a financial contribution. We can ask and expect him to multiply it and make it part of his superabundant provision for all the needs of his people. I won't get, have time now to get to the Nabarre Bible, the Navar Bible. Uh, but anyway, let's pray the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So who's there? Robin Leonard, Deborah Kruger. There we are. Amber Van Grant. Hi there. And Jack Smith. Christ is in our midst, he isn't always